the reason why God wants to be number one is not because he's power hungry. It's because he's right, the right. best thing. Right, right, right. And to right. put anything above him yeah, yeah, would yeah. be to put something less good mm-hmm. as the center of your reality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and if you mm-hmm. point the compass of your universe mm-hmm. towards something that's less than the ultimate good, you're going to get a broken life. And God's yeah. like, I want to be number one because it will lead to your flourishing, happiness, joy. Yeah. Not because I'm, I'm trying to like control you, but because right. I want what's best for you. Welcome to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel is a ministry that's dedicated to speaking the gospel out of every corner of scripture. In Luke 24, Jesus told his disciples that every part of the Bible was about him. So each week, hosts David and Seth work through a passage of scripture to see how it's all about Jesus and his good news. Let's jump in. Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We're starting a new book today, the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Seth, I've been how you calling feeling? it Zechariah for the last like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep getting Zephaniah and Zechariah mixed up, but it is Zephaniah. This is the one with the pH. The pH in it. Okay. So what what has you generally excited or scared or what's your vibe with what, Zephaniah? What's I mean, I'm very excited for the second podcast we'll do in the series in which we'll talk about God singing over us. Oh, I want to go to there. Us being quieted by his love. That sounds nice. Uh, but before we get there, we have to talk about the inevitable and unavoidable destruction <laughs> oh my God. that is coming towards God's people that no amount of obedience can overturn. Wow. <laughs> so that's... That's what's happening okay. in Zephaniah 1 and 2. And the good news, though, that we'll talk about today is the way in which God hides his people even from his own anger. Mm. And that's actually what Zephaniah's name means. Zephaniah's oh. name means hidden. hidden. The hidden one. The hidden one. Or the hider. Oh. And so he plays with his own name. And the hope of God's people is Zephaniah, that God will hide. Man, I really wish that like our books, because this has happened with almost every minor prophet. It really has. Where yeah. It's like, oh, the main point of the book is the the dude's name. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it makes, oh, it's so helpful. And it's like, I just wish that Zephaniah was called the hider. The hider. The hidden one. Yes. And it's like, okay, everyone turn to the hidden one, chapter one. It's like, yeah. oh, that, that'd be really helpful. That would be really helpful. <laughs> and it would clear up the Zephaniah, so Zechariah exactly? thing. Yeah. yeah, it would be, because I wouldn't call him the hidden one. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So today is the inevitable destruction of God's people, but the good news that he can still hide you. Yes, that's right. Okay. So get me into this book. Where are we in the history of Israel? What's Zephaniah's deal? What's going on? Well, thankfully, chapter one, verse one gives us a genealogy. Okay. Which is everybody's favorite, but it gives us all the historical clues really we helps. need. Because what, what was the book we did that like had none? It was uh, uh, there are a lot. There oh, are oh, Malachi had Malachi like, had none. none. That's right. Yeah, we were just like it's like a catch-all. That's right. Okay, it was a summary of the law and, and the prophets. The prophets. Okay, but Zephaniah does not leave us with that problem. <laughs> it does not. Okay. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah. So nice. the two names that will get us most in the book of Zephaniah are the names Hezekiah and Josiah. Yes. He was the great, great grandson of King Hezekiah from the book of Second Kings 19 and 20. Hezekiah was one of Israel's few good kings, and he was a reformer. Mm. He takes out a whole bunch of idols in Israel's land. He brings back a level of faithfulness to the temple and worshiping God in the right way. However, his life ends with this announcement that eventually Babylon's going to come and destroy Israel um, entirely. Okay. Because what Hezekiah does is he invites envoys, emissaries from Babylon into the temple to view all the gold of the temple. And this was, in his mind, probably a political move to curry some sort of trust between him and Babylon. But God saw that as like pride. But God saw that as him trying to hedge his bets, Mm. trusting Babylon in addition to Yahweh to protect Israel and said, because you decided to trust Babylon, by Babylon, you will be destroyed. Okay. So that doesn't happen though. Not right. really until after Josiah. So, okay. And how far apart 
were Hezekiah and Josiah? They weren't like immediate successors of one another. That's not, that's right. There was uh, Hezekiah, and then there was Manasseh, one of the most evil kings in Israel's history. Rock on. Followed by Amnon, his son, followed by Josiah. Okay. So not... Too far removed. So you have Hezekiah, a reformer, but kind of a mixed bag. He kind of falls in the end. Mm -hmm. Then there's a season of really, really bad kings. Yeah. And then Josiah comes, who's another reformer that Mm -hmm. we'll probably talk about. Yep, we will. Yes. But then after that. Right. And Josiah, interestingly, like Hezekiah, is a reformer. Right. And Josiah is probably the most famous, one of the most famous kings. Yeah. He's the one who finds the, the Torah, the Old Testament. And brings revival to the people of God. Right, he is a king when he's eight years old. I sung a Bible song about him. Eight? You did? Yeah. I don't know a and Josiah became, Bible. Oh, became a king when he was just eight years old. You don't know that? No. Song? I I sung songs about how he was Man. became a king when he was eight years old. I did not old. have a Josiah Bible uh, song. Anyway, so he becomes king when he's eight years old. By his eighteenth year in power, he discovers that there is a long lost copy of the law mm. hidden in the walls of the temple. He reads it, breaks down crying, realizing how far they've fallen mm-hmm. from God's commands. And he institutes this sweeping reforms, kicks out the idols of Baal out of the temple. He stops Molech worship, which is the child sacrificing oh, religion. Yeah. He stops all this stuff, cleans out God's temple, is clearing all the priests of everything they're doing wrong. And then the prophetess Holda comes up to him and says, Josiah, no matter what you do, you will not stop Babylon's coming destruction. Oh my gosh. And which is really crazy to me that yeah. all this obedience means nothing because it cannot overturn the centuries of atrocities that have occurred before Josiah yeah. or overturn the blatant evil of Manasseh that was his, you know, almost his two generations previous his right. predecessor. Um, and it's really kind of a sobering moment to think that no matter how much goodness that Josiah accomplishes in his lifetime, it will eventually lead to Babylon coming to destroy Israel. So Zephaniah is prophesying in a time where God's really doubling down on the inevitability and inescapable nature of Mm -hmm. God's punishment that's coming for Israel, northern or southern? Southern Southern, Israel. Southern Judah. Judah. Judah, Because of not necessarily Hezekiah and Josiah, but Mm -hmm. in spite of them. Because of the centuries of evil that have been Mm -hmm. done, God's like, I've been long-suffering, I've been patient, I've been slow to anger, but the piper's going to be paid no matter what. That's right. And so it's interesting to think about Zephaniah living during the time of Josiah's reforms. Mm -hmm. So Zephaniah's prophecies here are meant to encourage people to return back to the ways of Yahweh, return back to the ways of Hezekiah and Mm. David and people before him knowing full well that it will do nothing to stop Babylon from coming. Mm. And at the same time, that even while Josiah is purging Israel of all of its evil actors and its corrupt priests, many of them are still in power. And so a lot of the evil rulers of Israel get call-outs in the book of Zephaniah because these are precisely the people Josiah is taking out during his time in office. Mm. So it's a really interesting... It's like a politically, religiously, really interesting time. And then even like spiritually, how would I feel about being commanded to keep a Torah, a book of laws that I know will do nothing to improve my life? Mm. Is, that, is that entirely true or are you burying the lead a little bit? How so? Uh, well, because you said that the, there's good news that God will hide the humble. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, That's you, right. there's a difference between, oh, fine, I'll spare all of Judah. That's right. And I, I'll spare you. Well, what's interesting is that this happens before Babylon's invasion. Right. Right. So what's going to happen is some people in Israel will be humbled. Yeah. Some people will respond appropriately to Zephaniah's call to repent and to do the right thing. However, that won't stop Babylon from coming. Right. It won't stop the destruction of the temple. No. It won't stop them losing their homeland. Many of them will be exiled to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. Many of them will die before that exile is ever over. Right. And only the youngest of the young might even be old enough to see their return to the land. Yeah. And even once they, re- and those that do return to the land after knowing what it was like beforehand, weep that the restoration of Israel is right. nothing like it was before. So it's like, yeah. well, it's kind of a heavy place within Israel's history to occupy. Um, faithfulness. <laughs> uh, yeah. Faithfulness, knowing that the, the kingdom will never be like what it once was. Right. Okay. 
does Zephaniah pick up on any of that tension himself, or is that all like inferred from the situation? Uh, what do you mean? Like, is Zephaniah saying like, "Hey guys, I know it won't matter, but you should obey anyway"? <laughs> he kind of, yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. We should just okay. get into okay. it. Okay. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, chapter one, verse two. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And then he says this, I will sweep away man and beast, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. And if you Mm. notice, what's interesting about that, that's a reversal of the creation account. Yes. In creation, those things are come into existence the other way around right and now they're being broken broken the other down. way around there's uncreation coming yeah god's coming to uncreate the world and in particular i will stretch out my hand against judah mm. his people against all the inhabitants of jerusalem and i will cut off from this place the remnant of baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of heaven and who bow down and swear to the lord to swear to the Lord, yet also swear to Molech as well. Hmm. So he's coming to do what? He's coming to wipe out all the evil and corrupt idolatrous practices of Jerusalem, Hmm. and in particular in these verses, the priests of God's people. It's interesting how similar this seems to me to the flood story. Yes, that's right. You should think that. Okay, yeah, it seems very, because it's like, there's so much pervasive evil mm-hmm. in the world that the only way to get rid of it is to just clean the whole thing. And now idolatry and false god worship and wickedness has become so pervasive throughout mm-hmm. Judah that there's no hope for it, that it has to be completely wiped out. So That's really right. the Babylonian armies aren't necessarily just coming to judge the temple because the priests and the kings are bad, but they're coming as a cleansing flood to take away the false gods mm-hmm. like to actually rid oh, the right. land of right, right, right. evil i've never viewed i've only ever viewed ba- babylon coming into israel as punishment right not as cleansing not as yeah. like let me get rid of the idolatry mm-hmm. let me wipe it clean yes i've never seen it like that before zephaniah definitely picks up on that idea in chapter three okay where it's this judgment that happens to israel during this time is for its purification, mm. to rid the land of all evil so that the humble can inherit the purified land. Yeah. If the land is full of evil and idolatry and corruption and whatever else, murder, whatever right. else has caused God's punishment of sending Babylon. Okay. All that's going to be gone. Why? So that the humble can inherit the earth and come back and rebuild the land the way it was meant to be. Right, on a pure foundation. On a pure foundation, okay. yeah. Is there anything else going on with the flood creation stuff here that we should be attuned to? Except the fact that this is kind of supposed to signal a cataclysmic end to Israel as they know it. Hmm. Israel thought they would be God's chosen people forever. But God's saying, no, I'm tearing down this kingdom. I'm tearing down this temple. Hmm. And just as thoroughly as I created the world, Hmm. that's how thoroughly I will tear down what you've built. Right. Just as that was a beginning, this will be an end. That's right. Okay. That's right. And then he escalates. Oh, boy. How how can you escalate? I I don't, it's like, uh, (laughs) I don't think you can escalate from there, but this one turns my stomach a little bit. In verse seven, he says, be silent before the Lord. The day the Lord's near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. And he has consecrated his guests. And on that day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. A couple of interesting little things here. One, the leaders of God's people are full of violence and fraud. Right. That one feels pretty accurate. I will punish those that leap over the threshold. Weird. I don't know what that means. Nobody. It's a hard one. It goes back to 1 Samuel 5. Okay. It's when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. Yes. Is that the tumors and rats moment? Yeah, that's tumors and rats moment. It gets passed around all these different Philistine towns, and every time it's in one of them, plagues start breaking out. Right. That's why they keep passing it along. Hot potato. Hot potato with the Ark of the Covenant until one day it's put into the Temple of Dagon. Oh, right. And while the Ark of the Covenant's in the Temple of Dagon, Dagon falls over. And what happened to the gods of the Canaanites? Dagon. Dagon. <laughs> Dagon. <laughs> and his hands break off, his head falls off, and 
the detail we're given is that his head falls in the threshold of the Temple of Dagon. Mm. And then we're given a little narrative aside in 1 Samuel 5 that that's why the priests of Dagon jump over the threshold oh. of the Temple of Dagon to this so day. So is this saying, Zephaniah saying that Dagon worship is back? Either he's saying Dagon worship is back in the temple, so they've set up a, an idol to and Dagon in the temple. And they're recreating that old and they rite. Are, right, they are taking that superstition and bringing it into worship of the temple, which would be crazy. Crazy. Or they also talk about foreign attire, those who array themselves in foreign attire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably a reference to foreign priestly attire. Uh, so like they're wearing the robes of gods uh, that are... Supposed to be worn by priests to other gods, yes. but doing it in the temple. Dang. And is just, they're adopting all the religious practices. So there's a, a whole bunch of syncretism happening here. That's right. Where they're blending the religions, the practices, the beliefs of other gods and other sects mm -hmm. into Yahweh's temple. That's right. Thinking that they could somehow curry favor of all of them instead of That's just right. trusting God alone. That's right. Okay. And what's fascinating here is God says he'll punish these people, mm -hmm. but he also said, I'm going to prepare a sacrifice. Okay. So what I think he's saying is, okay, I'm going to destroy all people by making a sacrifice out of my people. So he's not making a sacrifice for his people. Which is what you would expect. People are the sacrifice. And to whom? I have consecrated his guests. He has consecrated a series of guests. And who is the guest that will feast on the body of corrupt Israel? Babylon. Babylon. Oh. God is making a sacrifice out of his people for Babylon. <laughs> Whoa. I, so that's why I was like, I, I see why your stomach's turning. Right, right. Bit. It's like, I'm like, that is viscerally disgusting. Yeah. But also just terrifying to imagine being, being so thoroughly corrupted by my syncretism that God says, I will make a sacrifice out of you to the people to Babylon, the people your fathers have historically tried to curry favor with to protect you from? Mm. No. They're going to eat you alive. They're going to eat you alive. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which is interesting to keep in mind that Zephaniah's ministry is presumably to get people to return yeah. and follow the Torah as Josiah the king is directing his people to. Right. And in one sense, he's directing this against all the leaders that Josiah is bringing down. Josiah is going to come and right. clear you out, guys. And if not him, then Babylon. And I guess, I mean, I would want to say, maybe if I was in Zephaniah's time, I would want to say that this is some kind of theological editorializing or he's being hyperbolic and he's like, you know, fire and brimstone to scare him straight kind of thing. Right. But we know that this no, actually happened. This it, it did happen, and it was it's been prophesied multiple times mm -hmm. that Babylon was coming. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's probably a shocking metaphor. Yeah, you know, like Babylonians aren't coming to eat them; they're not cannibals. No, you know, so that's not what's happening here. But pictorially, metaphorically, that is what's going to occur. Right. But it is put in such a visceral way that it's like. You would think if you were receiving this prophecy, you'd be like, wake up, man. The Ninevites of Jonah's day got a way chiller sermon than that, and right. they turned around. That's so. right. <laughs> and Jonah will get a mention not too far oh, from Oh, are that. you serious? Yeah, he I will. did not know that. that. Yeah, okay, he's going to get a mention not oh too far gosh. from that. And okay. that exact point. Jonah's like, people repented with unless. Oh, my and gosh. You didn't. I'm sniffing You're it out. You're sniffing it out. <laughs> you, you got your Bible hat on. You got your Bible nerd hat on. It's coming out. He continues, basically, on that day, declares the Lord. A wail will be heard throughout the city, and I will punish all the traitors, presumably those, kind of like the traitors in the temple during Jesus' day, those mm -hmm. making a profit off of those trying to worship, but he will punish all those people and all the complacent who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, and he will not do evil, i.e. Mm -hmm. saying, I'm living as a functional atheist. Yep. God isn't going to do anything either way. God doesn't really care. Mm -hmm. Everybody like this will... Uh, no longer be alive, will be taken away on that day. And then in verse 13, he says this, though they will build houses, they will not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. This is a reverse of the book of Deuteronomy. So remember, oh, right. Zephaniah you, yeah. living in the time when the scroll of Deuteronomy was just rediscovered. Okay. Yes. And the promise God has given his people is that if you obey my commands, you'll live in the land forever and you'll drink your own wine. And you'll eat the grapes from your own vine mm -hmm. and you're going to have a great time. But no, none of that's going to happen. Mm. Th that helps. Literally, the next question I was going to ask was, what is the, I don't know, argumentative basis 
that God is using against Israel? Like, is it mm-hmm. covenant? Is it Torah obedience? Is it generally you guys are just you guys just suck? Like, <laughs> right, right, right. Like, like it's this is such visceral language. Yeah, but we know God is good, just, long suffering, kind. Mm-hmm. So there has to have been some really intense infraction, and that's right. Uh, that that necessitates this kind of punishment. So I know other ones, you know, other other minor prophets, they they might be built around law code or covenant, or they're like a court case, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or like a marriage. There, there's a framing device. That's right. What's the framing device for Zephaniah? Like, what have they broken? That's that's determined that this punishment is going to come with such ferocity. Yeah, I mean, it's the crimes of Manasseh. So that that king between Hezekiah and Josiah. Right, yes. So Hezekiah, you know, does this thing with Babylon. He's prophesied Babylon's going to come and take away everything you have. Mm -hmm. Manasseh comes on the scene and he is, puts all these idols into the temple of Israel. He's Mm. the one in this era of history driving the idolatrous syncretistic practices of Israel forward. He's murdering people on a, like, a scale not really seen before in Israel's history. Like, like sacrificing people to the gods? or He's doing that, and then he's just being a bad king. Like, okay. he's just, like, a bad person. Yeah. I think it's Second Chronicles that describes him as, like, presiding over a city of blood. Like, that's the type of leader that he is. Yeah. And then, obviously, the law is not found anywhere during this time. And presumably, even during Hezekiah's day, did not necessarily have access to the law and did not know the full extent to which they were breaking God's commands. Yeah. So when Josiah finally finds it, that's why he's crying. That's why he's crying. He's like, we have failed the covenant so drastically. Mm. What's going to happen to us? And so he's like, let's do everything we can to fix it, which is why it's pretty sobering for Hulda to say, the prophetess to yeah. say, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. God prophesied that this would actually happen, that yeah. you guys would get worse and worse over time and that the ultimate result would be you leaving in exile. And that time has come. So would you say for Zephaniah, the chief problem is idolatry, mm-hmm. or is it covenant breaking? I know they're very, very similar, but yeah. does he have something at the center of his bullseye? Well, it's interesting because Israel is not the only people he's going to call out. Oh, okay. So we're about to get a whole list of nations that will be de- also be destroyed by Babylon <laughs> as okay. well. So and, and the book begins, as you remember, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Right. It's very to- so the, total. Yes, that's right. There's a totalizing effect. Even mm. the last words here, verse 17, I will bring distress on mankind right. so that they shall walk like the blind. All the earth will be consumed in the fire of my jealousy. And I will make uh, a full and sudden end to all the inhabitants of the earth. So there is, in, in one sense, I do believe that's actually a direct reference to Israel and those globalizing, those universal words are supposed to indicate the universal punishment that will come towards Israel. Mm-hmm. But we're about to expand the horizon of God's judgment against the nations of the world as well for their pride, presumably at Babylon's hands as well. So it, there is a sense of covenant breaking to mm-hmm. your point. It's like, why is God doing this? Well, right. they've broken the covenant. He told them what would happen if they broke the covenant. Right. But in a more global sense, he's judging pride on a global scale as mm-hmm. well. All right, Seth. So let's talk about pride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hope so, you're not. I hope you're not too proud to have this conversation. I, I hope. I mean, I probably am. <laughs> um, I probably am. Yeah. Chapter two opens. It s- transitions from talking about Israel's failure, in large part, without naming it as such, like their failure to obey the covenant and the inevitable day of destruction coming to them by Babylon. Interestingly, though, I didn't say this in the first part. Babylon's never mentioned. Oh, in all of Zephaniah. I know in chapter one, he's never mentioned. Okay. But I actually don't think he's mentioned, uh, Babylon's mentioned at all. Is it Zephaniah. because God is wanting to make sure they know it's him? That's right. I think punishment? he wants to foreground his responsibility in coming to execute right. justice. Because for them, it could just look like war games. That's right. It could. Like, oh man, Babylon's big and strong and they want our stuff. That's right. He's like, no, no, no. That's me. That's me. Okay. I'm coming to do this. That makes yeah. sense. 
Number two, so gather together. Yes, gather together, O oh, shameless nation. So we're moving outside of Israel here, but before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord. Before, so you're saying, listen up, everybody, before this happens. That's right. Before okay. and, these, and we haven't introduced this like idea yet, but the day of the Lord oh, yes. is it's a pretty important category for a lot of the minor prophets. Right. Also for Zephaniah. This day when he comes and judges Israel for their evil and their hypocrisy and their idolatry, he calls it the day of the Lord, mm. the day of fire, a day of burning anger. Yeah. And that day of the Lord, that day of burning anger is also coming on the world itself, the n- proud nations around them. And so continue. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, mm. and who do justice, seek righteousness, and seek humility, and perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the Lord's anger. Mm. That's that hidden language that we've yep. been talking about previously. You might be Zephaniah. That you might be a Zephaniah, that you yeah. might be a hidden one on the day of the Lord's anger. Mm. And this is important because this is the hope. We haven't had any hope so far. Right. Israel has been given no opportunity, no even inkling that there could be somebody left behind. Right. But now that we've transitioned out to the broader world, we're saying, no, no, this critique is actually only for the proud. Okay. There is a humble few among you Uh that if they remain faithful, will be hidden from the day of God's just and burning anger. Okay. Which that helps because I was going to ask the whole question of, man, how come Manasseh gets to determine the fate of a bunch of people? Yeah. You know, but that's right. There's a way. Isn't there somebody? Isn't there one person that's innocent? Yeah. He's like, it doesn't deserve to be swept away. It's kind of, I kind of want to play Abraham with Sodom here. I'm like, Mm -hmm. come on, God, for 10 people, you know? Right. But he's like, no, even for one person, I'm still going to wipe out Israel. Yeah. But I'm now providing that one person or those 10 people, those 100 people, those 10,000 people, whatever the number is, a, a, way to be a way to be hidden. And that pathway is humility. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yes. Hidden in humility. And then he starts listing cities. Gaza will be deserted. Ashkelon will become a desolation. Ashdod's people will be driven out at noon. Ekron will be uprooted. Are these like immediate neighbors? Those are all Israel? Philistine cities. Okay. Which is interesting. That's where that idea of like jumping over the... Oh, right. All uh, came from. The threshold came from. Yeah. Uh, yes. And these would be near neighbors to Israel. Woe to you inhabitants of the seacoats, you nation of the Cherethites, you O Canaan, land of the Philistines. O you on the seacoast, you will turn into pasture land with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, and there they will graze. So what continues through a lot of chapter two, and we'll just stop here for now, is this idea that these proud nations these seacoast nations, these civilizational centers on the seacoast commanding the trading routes of the Mediterranean will all fall and the humble of the land will inherit the ruined city and make their new homes in the pasture lands they leave behind. Whoa. So it's like there's a lot kind of going on like on a, like a literary artistic level. Mm. You have these civilizational centers, these idolatry, these centers of idolatry that mm-hmm. will be raised to the ground, turned to ruins, and then the humble of the land will inherit them like shepherds would inherit a flock and they'll live in this rural, peaceful reality where all the buildings of pride have been totally flattened. Mm. And we, we are at that reference in chapter one, two. There'll be no more traitors anymore. Oh, right. These just are, sheep. Right. Yeah, just sheep. Just yeah. sheep and shepherds living a life of peace, huh. not the frenetic and proud and potentially corrupt life of the cities. Like there's yeah. this rural sense to the peaceful, humble inheritance God's people will have. There's this Wendell Berry thing. This Wendell Berry thing that I'm getting super excited about right now. Uh, but yes, that's the hope. Yeah. That once the civiliza- the proud civilizations are gone, the humble will inherit the land and live in it in peace. Okay. So talk to me then about these two categories yeah. of pride and humility, right? Because those are gigantic open categories that people can put whatever they want in. Yeah. Like pride, you're a jerk, humble, you're you're sheepish and like you don't have any opinions. Yes. Like, I had the same question reading through this. Okay. Because Zephaniah seems to understand that you know what, what pride and mean. humility means. Yeah. Like in verse eight, he critiques Moab and the Ammonites because they have taunted God's people mm. and have made boasts against their territory. Which means for Zephaniah, he believes the sin of pride in Moab and Ammon is their presumptuous attitude 
towards the nation of Israel. Hmm. They believe that they are owed the nation of Israel and that they can take it by military force okay. in some sense. Yep. Or they say that your God's not in there and your God's not very strong. These things are elements of pride, presuming to have land that's not your own, dismissing the God of Israel as a powerful deity that deserves respect. That's pride and like contextually, like really narrowly contextually, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's one thing. That what, we're told. What about for the Israelites? Like, what would you say for Zephaniah? What would be Israel's example of pride? Right. Like, how? Because obviously they did have the land and mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. did believe in God. But so it has to be a little different than that. That's right. That example. Well, we've been told already that they're building false idols. Uh huh. Right? They're putting up Baal and Molech statues and worshiping other gods, sacrificing their own children in the temple of the one God. Idolatry is a form of pride Mm -hmm. in this particular sense. But honestly, this was one of the struggles that I had when I was reading. It seemed like pride and humility were built out categories without giving me a whole bunch to go off Mm -hmm. of, except some like proud nations who have corrupt trading practices, (laughs) and then also Israel who has been idolatrous and who has imported the practices of other religions into their worship of the one true God. And these are my primary examples of of pride. There seems to be at least some overlap between those two definitions you've given of those outside Israel and inside Israel of disregarding God's authority. Mm -hmm. That God said, I'm the Lord your God. Here are the laws. You shall have no other gods before me. And they're like, ah, never mind. We'll put some other gods in here. And then those outside, they're like, oh yeah, that's Yahweh's territory, but meh. We're just going to take it. I think it belongs to us. They're just disregarding God's authority. They Mm -hmm. believe that they have a say where God says that he has the say. And so they're putting their own opinions, thoughts, definitions of right and wrong over Yahweh's. And so it's like elevating human thought and opinions over what God has revealed and said and declared. Yeah. I think that's pretty a pretty good base level definition of pride and it works for both Israel and the nations because like Israel they had a law at one point in time and even though it was lost they did have some sense of what constituted faithful service to God and they were abandoning it in favor of the worship of other gods right and then the other nations of the world have never really honored God in that way right and have chosen their own way they have opportunities to come to Israel they have opportunities to worship Israel's God There's a whole bunch of people that are not Jewish who are worshipers of the true God and Bible, but they've not chosen that path and have said instead built civilizational centers built around money and trading and power rather than humility, humility towards the God of Israel. Yeah. So I think we've talked about like pride as it comes, because if we use love God and love neighbor as the law grid for understanding pride and humility, we've addressed love God. Right. And we're like, the mm-hmm. pro- that kind of pride does not love God well. It says that I'm smarter than God and I know more than him. So you're not loving God. But then there's also hints in Zephaniah of the love neighbor problem. Mm-hmm. But there's not justice and there's problems with the traitors and there's these economic issues right. at stake. They're killing their children and, yep, that's right. and people. And so it's like they're also lording over their neighbors and uh, with evil instead of love. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that right. kind of that pride of, I don't know what you want to call it, like the the presumption that I have the right to hurt someone else yeah, or to preference myself over someone else yeah, is the other kind of pride maybe. Right, and, that's, and it's probably just a good category. When we talk about God's laws or honoring God, it's like that's exactly what it is. That means to love God and to love neighbor and to do refuse to do either of those things isn't just not loving God and not loving your neighbor. It's an act of pride mm-hmm. as well. It's refusing to humble yourself to the wisdom and necessity of loving God and loving neighbor. And if you choose to do otherwise, that invites the justice of God against you. And so then the opposite would be humility. Right. How do you love God in humility? Well, you submit to what he said. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself under what what he said. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You all should have no other gods before me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can submit to that. I'll I'll serve no other gods. I'll trust you alone. Uh, And then for my neighbor... How do, I, how do you humble yourself to your neighbor? Well, you obey the commands that God gave you on how to love your neighbor well. 
Yeah. Right. You, That's right. You help them out. That's right. <laughs> you treat them well. You don't covet their wife. You don't steal from them. You don't murder them. Mm-hmm. Like pretty simple things, but yep. you know. Right. So that makes sense. I think we're talking about God's laws for Himself and for others, and pride is elevating yourself above them, saying you know better, and you can set your own definitions of right and wrong. Yeah. Humility is saying I don't know better, and I'm going to obey what God has said is right and wrong. Here's a pretty, a pretty visceral example of that in verse 15. So the last several verses are devoted to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Mm-hmm. And verse 15 says this, This is the exultant city, Nineveh, that lived securely, and said in her heart, I am, and that's actually the covenant name of God. Yep. I am. And there is no one else. Yeah. So there's this like culture. And before this verse, it talks about it's like cultural power and cultural significance. So it's like to to have that position like where well, I am the ultimate authority of my life. Mm-hmm. I am the center of either the civilizational, cultural or spiritual universe. That right. is pride. And Nineveh was a really glowing example of that. They yeah, that is really intense. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that the Ninevites in their hearts were saying, I am and there is no one else. It's just like that is like the current postmodern worldview. Yeah, that is, yeah, that is all humans through all time. I am and, and there, there is, is no, no other. Else. Like I set the definition of right and wrong. I know like what the best way for my life is. I Here's determine my... who I'm loving to and who I'm not to. I determine which God gets my fealty. Right. Here's yes. my truth. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, so that's an example of pride. Yeah. Yeah. I think that helps. That conversation helps of pride and humility because I think on the one hand, it'd be easy to say like, oh, pride is a disposition. You know, oh, you're haughty. You're walking around with your chest puffed yeah. up. You think you're better than everybody yeah. else. Yeah. And humility is this little weak person. Right. Or on the other side, it's like this huge ostentatious show of religious pride with a mm-hmm. golden breastplate or something yeah, yeah, yeah. and then humility's gandhi you know and it's yep it's starvation right and it's like no self-obligation that, none of those are helpful categories quite quite, right. quite it yeah. yeah it's it's are you letting god say i am mm-hmm. and there is no one else yeah and you isn't let, that the first the ten commandments basically yeah <laughs> like i am the lord your god and there right. shall be no others right right and so Pride is not obeying the first commandment. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. That's really clarifying. And then humility is being like, okay, you're the only God. Mm-hmm. What do you want to say? What do you want to do? You are and there is no one else. Yeah. That's interesting. To flip Nineveh's words is the difference between pride and humility. Pride mm-hmm. says, I am and there is no one else. Mm-hmm. Humility says, you are and there is no, no one else. else. That's cool. That's really cool. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you for going down that rabbit no, no, trail with me. I needed that too. Okay. So so the question mm-hmm. is, so that's the end. We have to get us to the end of chapter two. Okay. Destruction has been promised to Israel. Destruction has been promised to the nations. Yeah. But there is a hope of being hidden. Okay. For, for the, humble. the humble. Okay. So. We have all our categories? We have all our categories. I can ask more questions? You ask more questions. Okay, great. Uh, first, why is God so offended by pride? Ah. Why, why right. this, I'm going to sacrifice you to the Babylonians because of your pride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what is it about pride that not only elicits, but I would say because I believe in the justice and goodness of God, right, rightfully deserves that kind of reaction. Mm. I mean, only like one of the deepest questions yeah, in all of theology. But I mean, I think we said it, like, if you're claiming to be the ultimate authority of the universe. Mm-hmm. You're making a run for God's seat. Right. Yeah. Like, he is and there is no other. Right. He is the ultimate authority. Being in existence. He is the one who gets to determine the laws. He's the one who does everything. Yet I am, and there is no other beside me. Yeah, it is interesting that it opens up with creation language. Uh Uh-huh. Because when you look at the story of creation, it is unarguable who is, and there is no other. That's right. Right? God speaks, and everything submits. Mm -hmm. And what happens? What happens when God is the ultimate authority? Mm -hmm. Peace harmony, life, creation out of chaos, goodness, flourishing, multiplication. Right. Everything good happens when that order is correct. Yeah. When God is and there is no else and everything else is submitted to him, mm-hmm. that's how the world's supposed to work. 
That's and right. what comes out of it is not like some despot ruling a broken dystopian world, mm. which is what people would probably think of yeah. a god who wants full authority. Right. It's actually creation and beauty and flourishing. It's like actual life. Actual life. When we start to try to take over that seat, mm -hmm. it's the fall. Mm -hmm. It's what Eve did. She mm -hmm. tried to determine good and evil for herself. She put her word above God's word mm -hmm. and she brought death, thorns, brokenness yeah. into yeah. the world. Yep. Yeah. And so we're actually talking about that. And I think this kind of goes to the idea that the reason why God gets the top seat is because there's no greater good than God. Hmm. The reason why God wants to be number one is not because he's power hungry. It's because he's right. the best thing. Right, right, right. And to put right. anything above him yeah, yeah, would yeah. be to put something less good mm -hmm. as the center of your reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and if you mm -hmm. point the compass of your universe mm -hmm. towards something that's less than the ultimate good, you're going to get a broken life. And God's yeah. like, I want to be number one because it will lead to your flourishing, happiness, joy. Yeah. Not because I'm, I'm trying to like control you, but because right. I want what's best for you. Here's what's something that's crazy. Just mm. to keep that in mind. Like the reason we should obey God because he wants what's best for us. Yeah. Do you remember how King Josiah died? No. So King Josiah is this great reforming king. Yeah. But he dies trying to prevent the destruction of Israel. Mm. God prophesied Israel would be destroyed. Right. God also told this to other world leaders apparently during that time. You could read this in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 35, one of whom was the pharaoh of Egypt. Uh -huh. he's, going, he's going on his way to this battle. And then King Josiah comes up to try to stop him. And the Pharaoh says, why are you trying to fight me? I'm not at war with you. God has told me to do this. Mm. Stop opposing God who is with me mm. or he will destroy you. But Josiah didn't listen to the word of the Lord and he died in battle by an arrow, which is interesting because in the book of Chronicles, at least, the book of Chronicles opens with Saul dying by a stray arrow. Yes. In the middle of the book of Chronicles, is Ahab not listening to the voice of God and being killed by an arrow. And then the Second Chronicles almost ends with another of one of Israel's kings not listening to the voice of God and being killed by an arrow. <laughs> wow. And so it's interesting in Zephaniah, is like one thing we're told to obey is we're told to obey God's laws, to be humble. But we're also told to obey the fact that God will destroy his people in order to purify them. Mm -hmm. And Josiah, in a moment, not wanting that reality to be true, tries to stop the destruction of Israel yeah. and ends up dying himself. Yeah, that is interesting. Because the destruction of Israel w is the right thing to happen. It would have been the best thing that would have led to their flourishing. Right. Was to wipe out the to corrupt. To die first. Yeah, to die first, to wipe out the corruption, mm -hmm. to kill it. And it's like, that's, I mean, there's so much there now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's so much there now. I mean, because for G Jesus does the opposite. Okay. Jesus does the opposite. He knows his day is coming. The day of the Lord is coming for Jesus. He talks about it mm -hmm. throughout his ministry, mm -hmm. that he knows that one day he's going to have to die, mm -hmm. that death has to come first, that, that yeah. the armies of Rome instead of Babylon are going to come against his body, the final temple of God, right. and raise it to the ground. And what's the thing all of his disciples keep saying? No, no, no. You're, you, no one has to die here. Don't do that. Let's go huh. talk to Pharaoh. <laughs> like, let's... There's no stray arrows coming that's for so, you. That's right. It's so funny. And then, <clears throat> then Jesus calls that when Peter says it, that's the, the lie of Satan. That Yep. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. When and for the first to, time. When people like, are trying to prevent yeah. the destruction. Right. They are actually listening to the voice of Satan and they're missing the life-giving death blow of God mm. that would be for the good of his people. And so Jesus is the first king of Israel who actually mm. ignores and fights the lie of Satan to let the death come upon him that God right. necessarily must bring, which is the same kind of death that he's bringing here in Zephaniah. Yeah. It's his anger against sin mm -hmm. and pride, right? And our mm -hmm. brokenness, he brings it and Jesus says, I'm going to step up and I'm going to mm -hmm. let that death come to me, mm -hmm. right? And he lays it down. And what happens on the other side? Alignment, because he was humble instead of proud. He, he comes under God, and God, what, creates flourishing and life and new creation through his death. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. And we are primed for that sort of sacrificial role when Zephaniah tells us that God will make a sacrifice out of the leaders of his people. Mm. And what is a sacrifice supposed to do? Oh, bring atonement. Bring atonement. Make peace with his right. people. Yeah. 
in this case, the people who are eating the sacrifice are the, ba- the Babylonian armies. But what is Jesus? Jesus is a, the leader of God's people mm-hmm. who is sacrificed for his people, consumed by the mouth of Rome, right? and yet purifies his people on the other side. Yep. That's beautiful. It's it's interesting, too, how it applies to Jesus' teaching, right? Because I'm often now trying yeah, to do yeah, this yeah. thing where he's our Lord and our Savior, our teacher and our Savior. Yeah. And so we, we've said, okay, here's how it maps on to him as our Savior, mm-hmm. but it also maps on to how he taught how he taught us, like how he's trying to make us disciples. Yeah. And he's like, if anybody wants to come after me, let them take up their cross. Right. Die. Right. And then follow me. If you try to gain your life, you're going to lose it. Mm-hmm. But if you lose your life, if you go through the death, right. you're going to gain it. And so the same mm-hmm. thing that Jesus confronted that Josiah didn't comes to us too, that right. God wants us to go through death. He wants to kill off the things in us that aren't bringing right. life, that are proud, that are out of line of our flourishing. Mm-hmm. And he wants us to bring all of those things in humility under him. And that takes death. Right. So like so much of your, my life or lives in general are spent trying to avoid suffering. Yeah. And the expectation that Jesus solves the problem of death and suffering. Mm. But the book of Zephaniah shows, as does Jesus' own teaching, that the way to live a more holistic, purified, good life is actually to die a whole bunch of times first yeah. and to not avoid the suffering that comes with all those, the many deaths that come when you pursue humility over pride. Right. Yeah, think about how what God said to, I think it was Ananias who ended up meeting Paul after he had his mm-hmm. encounter. Mm-hmm. And he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for yeah. my sake. Yeah. And what came out of Paul's suffering? Like the birth of the Christian movement throughout the Gentile world. That's right. Right? That's so right. much life, so much flourishing, right. so much goodness. But look at the lists of suffering that Paul makes in like Second Corinthians. I was stoned, I was flogged, I was shipwrecked, <laughs> I was I almost died, I was starving to death. Like right. why? Because look at all the flourishing. Mm-hmm. But if Paul had said no to the death, that flourishing wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And so that's the way the kingdom works is mm. death comes first and we have to accept it in humility. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of this episode where we kind of asked a few questions that we didn't really have answers for. Yeah. Like one was why do the good people, the humble, have to suffer alongside the bad? Or another way we put it was it doesn't matter how humble you are or how much you obey. An destru- inevitable day. Yeah, destruction inev- is coming. Inevitable <laughs> suffering and destruction is coming and you're just going to have to deal with it. And it's like how is that good news? Yeah. Well, it's because of the disposition of the proud versus the humble. Mm-hmm. The proud are going to puff up their chest and be like, you know, they're going to go down with the ship and they're, they're going to try to avoid death they're gonna at go, all costs. There we go. Yeah, yes. they're going to go out swinging. I'm going to win this fight. Mm-hmm. I'm going to push Babylon back. They're not going to take us alive. Mm-hmm. The humble are going to receive the death that comes mm-hmm. and their fates might look similar. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. But what God does with it is going to be different. Yeah. Which is just so interesting. That is really interesting. And so what God's asking us to do in Zephaniah is to accept inevitable death. Hmm. Because he will bring inevitable life. Yeah. There's the there's, there's the, the through line. The through line for the poem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have anything to add on that. That is powerful. And I think it's just we've we've made a whole bunch of crazy examples of like Paul like was beaten, almost died four times. Right. But like this is just the normal way of Christian living. It's like every time a husband says sorry, you're dying to your right to be right all the time. Right. And what's going to happen? You're going to have a better conversation with your wife. Life. <laughs> like, yes, like, <laughs> life. Absolutely. It's like when you choose not to always express your opinion, mm-hmm. but like restrain yourself, show some self-control. You're going to have better relationships. You're going to have better relationships. When you choose... You're going to be seen as more wise. Right. When you, yeah. yeah, when you choose death mm-hmm. in all the ways that you will need to choose death in your life, you will choose life for yourself. Yeah. The only other thing I can think about right now, at least, that I want to highlight is all these frameworks that we've built now with Zephaniah mm-hmm. bring new color and helpfulness to me when I think about Revelation, actually, okay. because it's a very similar idea. You've got this worldwide cleansing that takes place when Jesus comes back and the new heavens, the new earth, you know, collide yep. and the old heavens and old earth pass away. There's this 
worldwide cleansing mm-hmm. that happens. And I've only ever even seen that as punishment of the wicked. Right. Jesus comes, he punishes the wicked. Right. And saves the humble. The proud are destroyed and the humble get hidden. That's right. right. But what, what he's also doing, we've talked about this other times, but for some reason the categories are landing really nicely for me today, that the only way for there to be pasture land for the sheep in the mm-hmm. coastland cities of mm-hmm. empire that used mm-hmm. to be there yeah, yeah, yeah. is if the idols are driven out. Right, if the right. if the wickedness is actually taken out of the land, right, that the the coming of Jesus and the passing away of the old heavens and old earth, it's a getting rid of everything that's going to be unaligned with God being right. the ultimate. Yeah, right. Anything that's not right, right, right. humble under God. Yeah. So that way you can have an entire universe of flourishing. Yeah, I keep thinking to like another. Well, Jesus says it. The meek will inherit the earth. The mm-hmm. humble will inherit the oh, earth. Oh, right. And Zephaniah 2 is all about these massive civilizational centers falling and then being inherited by the humble. Yeah. Like, the, they take over the city. Uh, they in, the, in Zephaniah 2, they don't rebuild the city. They just live in the environs around the city. There's yeah. this rural kind of thing that's happening. But they inherit that land and rebuild a new society. And what I think is really interesting about that is like the nature of humility is that it never grasps for power. Mm-hmm. And so most humble people feel that the powerful are always taking advantage of them yeah. and they're never getting an opportunity to do what is is right and good and humble and loving in alignment with God's laws. Mm. But the promise is that all the people exercising their authority, <laughs> proudly exercising their th- authority, building civilizations out of their authority, all those things will be, and, and excluding the humble from those processes, mm-hmm. will be torn down, and one day the humble will finally be given the chance to rule. Yeah. And what kind of civilization do you think the meek build? The, the kingdom, kingdom of, of God. Yeah. The kingdom of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> what else could they possibly could, build? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Okay. What's well, Zephaniah 1 and 2? That's Zephaniah 1 and 2. So next week, it's God's going to sing over us. Uh, we have a little bit more judgment to get through first, but oh, then okay, God okay, will okay. sing over Eventually us. Eventually, the song is coming. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you guys for joining us uh, in Zephaniah 1 and 2, and we'll see you next time in the rest of Zephaniah. We'll see you there. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next week.